It is Monday, September 18th at 5.04 p.m. Uh, the Board of Commissioners of the Harvard Electric Department is meeting. All commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan and Bess Essery. Uh, and we also have Ken Nolan and Steve Barman and Brooke Dink. Um, are there any modifications to the agenda? I would just like to, if we have time, I don't want to make it a longer meeting. If we have time, and it's four, seven. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about customer service um, and philosophy mission and that kind of thing. Um, but we can, we can wait as well. Um, and that would be at the end. Um, so the next item, uh, I'm separate to that, MG, uh, is the agenda approved. Your motion. I approve the agenda. Uh, a second. Second. Okay. Any objection? Hearing on the agenda is approved. Um, which takes us to the minutes from the meeting on August twenty first. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move. Is there a second. 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 Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, that was a vote. The minutes pass are approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a public comment period, and there doesn't appear to be anyone from public here, which takes us to um, the market and purchase power strategy with look at offline for the foreseeable future and the 2022 audit report. Follow up with Ken. Hi, Ken. Good, Good evening. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm, I'm also in a hotel room, so I'm going to leave the video <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's stupid. Um, oh. You can start with Wolcott if you prefer. Um, uh, however, it makes sense to you to do it. Yeah, Wolcott first. All right. Um, Mike, am I clear to share my screen? Oh, Talk it through, but I, for me at least, the numbers sometimes help to see them. Okay. Okay, hopefully my screen's coming through. Uh, it is, but it's pretty small. I can't, I can't read it. Pretty small. But I lost my distance glasses in the car because I thought we were going to be. Everything into the screen. That might have. But. Oh, I lost it. You can crank it like that. Getting the point is readable. <laughs> Do a little closer. Yeah. I think this is the same. This is the same spreadsheet I think Mike shared with you previously. So I I can just talk through it if, if that helps. Share. I missed this one. Did I lose it in the email chain? Yeah. This was what I sent from Ken this morning. It was. Um. No, it was an email that I sent. It was an email that I sent previously that described what's in this spreadsheet. So let me let me just walk through with you. Um, yes. when when the Wolka plant went down, Mike reached out and uh, said it's at least down for the winter. Uh, we don't really have an estimated return time. So and and asked whether we should be purchasing to cover the, the facility. Um, we did some research internally and looked at a couple of different purchase strategies. One would be looking about two thirds of what you need for coverage, um, trying to get somewhere in the uh, low 90s for a coverage ratio. We also looked at, let me go down a little bit, um, 
Can, what are, I, I don't know what we're looking at, these different columns or what the rows are because the row labels aren't uh, visible. So you're moving, but I have no idea what, what, what any of this is apart from the percentages I'm guessing are coverage ratios. Right, so it's not working. I'm gonna stop sharing, just talk about it. All right, so, so we looked at the winter period here in particular from, um, November through March being the period when you have the low the largest deficit in the coverage ratio with Wolcott down. Even with the facility offline, you're still in the mid 80s for coverage, which is not very bad. Um, the winter tends to be a little bit more dicey because prices can go up um, in the winter period. The summer tends to stay pretty stable. So we're not worried about the September, October time period, both the amount of power the plant historically produces isn't that much and prices tend to be low. Um, so you're not really, there's no concern for the next couple of months. We were looking at, at the winter period and looking at what we should do, VEPSA looked at two different approaches. One, buy about 900 kilowatts of power um, across the six month period from November to March. Second, looking specifically at um, November, December, January, when the plant historically does pretty well and the prices can be higher. We looked at, about, at buying a megawatt and a half of power for those three months as another alternative. However, what we were seeing is the winter prices look extremely high right now. We're seeing prices for, well, at the time we did the analysis, we were seeing winter January prices of $160 a megawatt hour. So if we just look across that six month period, with the amount of energy the plant historically produces and the prices we were seeing, the estimate we had was about $220,000 to replace the production from Wolka. There, there are essentially, we looked at three different ways to serve that. The first would be to buy the, the 900 kilowatts for the six month period. That would require you locking into a purchase today of about $140,000 and would only get you to about 91% coverage ratio. So you'd still be a little bit short. The second alternative of buying a megawatt and a half during the highest price periods still cost um, upwards of $180,000. And you would have a little bit of purchasing left to do and get, get you to about the 95% for those uh, core winter months. When we looked at the pricing, our recommendation uh, to Mike was to let the facility deficit ride on the monthly decisions that VEPSA makes. So at the end of every month, the last week of every month, we look at the following month and make purchases to get every member up to a minimum 95% coverage. With the strong prices we were seeing this winter, our feeling is they're gonna come off. The, the gas storage is still very robust going into the winter period. When we look at the NOAA forecast, we're seeing weather predicted to be warmer than, than normal. Um, so we think the prices are very high. They got a lot of risk premium built into them just because of ISO New England saying the sky is falling. Um, the recommendation was not to buy, to let it go month to month. Um, since we did that analysis, I asked uh, Heather Darcy to send me the price, latest pricing we have. And she sent me this morning um, prices from September 15th. And we've already seen the winter market drop about 6% from what it was when we first had this conversation with Mike. So given that situation, we're still recommending that we look at it every month, 
um, continue to monitor the market prices and see if they come off further, which we think they will. And if we get to something that's more realistic of what the winter prices should be, then we would look to lock in the remaining months. Uh, but we're not we're not seeing a lot of risk in the market right now to let it uh, sit uncovered for the next two to three months. I guess I'll stop there and answer questions if you have any. This is what was covered in the email that you sent on, um, last on Thursday, I guess. Yeah. I, I just had a question from what is five by sixteen? Five by sixteen that is what the day. That's what they on peak power, so that's Monday through Friday from eight in the morning till eleven at night. That was what I was guessing, but didn't, didn't know that. I guess my reaction is is that your recommendation makes sense to me, and I think even more so because of our cash position, where we would if we had to lock in at one hundred and fifty or one hundred and eighty thousand dollars, we'd have to borrow money to do that, and. Um, which is not capital investment, it's operating costs. And with interest rates, what they are, that even shrinks the gap further between just going month to month and seeing if we need to lock in or not. So the, I think the only thing I didn't nail down with you, Ken, is what that target winter price would be where you'd be saying, okay, this is a good spot, we should buy something. Yeah, I don't have an act a firm position, Mike, because it'll depend on when how much of the winter's left. But I think I think if we see average pricing coming down into for the six month period, right now it's about a hundred and seven hundred and eight dollars. If it gets to ninety five, then I think it's worth locking in uh, going forward. But we'll be we'll be looking at it every month, and as the early months roll off, that future projection will go up a little bit because we, we tend to see October, November, early December prices are cheaper. Uh, January and February are where they're really expensive. We're we're still in the hundred and twenty dollar megawatt hour range for, for those couple of months. Well, how is the lock-in cost calculated? Is that just some kind of a PV of the of whatever the expected price is? It's an it's a weighted average um, on what your what the production of the plan is. So how much how big the gap is we would be filling and the the monthly on peak price for that month. So on on average, if we were when we looked at it um, to fill an equivalent amount of production to what Wolcott would normally produce. The original price was like $109 average across the entire six month period. We're now seeing that come down. It's closer to, I think it's 105 when we looked at it today. It's about a 6% decrease. But if we think the price is stable or coming down, why would we lock, why would we prepay it um, with, without any benefit of, of um, you know, coming of, of cost of money? Um, cost of money isn't really what drives it, uh, but you're you're basically paying the forward price right now. You'd be committing to that price, which has, in our in my estimation, a lot of winter risk premium built into it. So it's people are concerned that there'll be a natural gas shortage and ISO New England's gonna put in um, emergency pricing in some, some period because the natural gas is gonna be used for heating. That's really what's driving the the pricing. The The cost so, of money over the six month is not- No, no, I understand the cost of money is driving it, but the cost of money is a factor for us because we are have a very thin cash uh, cushion. And so we would be in a position where if we're talking something in, in six figures, figures, or even upper five figures, we might well need to borrow that money. And, and so that's why I'm asking the question, why, why, as the winter goes forward, and I guess we can look at this every month, so it, it doesn't need an answer now, but I was just trying to sort of get my head around the process. Yeah, um, you're, you're 
you're taking risk off the table. Right? If, if the pricing gets down to a point that looks reasonable in the historical context, then you can you're, you're decreasing then, the risk. You're decreasing you, the you risk. can lock in, and then you take that win the the risk of a winter cold spell coming in off the table. I understand the cash position, and that is a factor, but I think VEPSA can work with you to float that. Um, pay now, pay later. You know, <laughs> um, on our books, it's going to be it, it won't make any real difference as long as the price is something that makes sense to everybody. Okay, that's that's, that's helpful. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. I don't know if we need a motion or not. Okay. I don't think we do. Um, it's an update. But there's no action on taking this. Yes, people think we should. So I would be helpful, Ken, uh, if you can have the team kind of Shoot us a summary email here for each month for the next two, three months. So we can have that as an update item at our meetings. That would be great. Hold on. Okay. Okay. The still yours. Okay. Uh, on the audit. Um... So I'll just I'll just kick that off that we had our review with our auditor last month and the section of his report that is filled with data directly from VETSA is where we had some confusion and noted that the H11 was missing. <laughs> That's what we're looking for you to walk us through today. Has the commission seen the email I sent you this morning, Mike? I forwarded it. I have I I, I, I not. I, 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 oh, I, I did see. I did see that. So the reason I sent Mike an updated email is because I I went through the numbers on Friday with the power supply team, and in fact, you were right. The H eleven was not included. Uh, this was. You know, no excuses. We we made a mistake. Um, it was during a transition from Sean to Heather, and we didn't do the review that should have been done. So um, the new file that I sent to Mike has the corrected data with the H11 in there. H11 was 6.2% of your supply, and it changes the other percentages for other, the other uh, contracts and generation slightly. Um, they all go down a little bit and then it shows H11 being making up the difference. So that needs to be corrected in the audit. The other thing in looking at this, since you put the whole thing in, um, in note seven, it says that HED has, has agreements with VEPSA to purchase hundred percent of, and it's not an agreement with VEPSA, it's an agreement with Billings Road. Number seven. So that needs to be changed or in, in the report as well. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm not sure where the language in the audit came from. We can't find any record of that on our side. Um, but I, I noted that as well, that it's it said it's a contract through VEPS and it should not be. Yeah. I think the rest of them looked okay to me, but that one... Um, so that was, that should be correct. Now I've gone through the numbers myself over the weekend. I'm pretty comfortable with where we are. If there's any other questions as far as the generators, let me know. Um, I guess the other note that came through was confusion with how the calculations are done in them. Want to just first of all check is that if that the question I'm that you're looking for me to answer here is walk you through it how the numbers are calculated. Yeah, so basically the numbers showed that our costs were actually a credit, as I recall. You remember that right, team? Yeah. Well, there are charges and there are credits, both. Correct. This this and, says, yes, and it shows as a net credit. It shows as a net credit. Yeah, we didn't understand that. So this is an ISO New England thing, and I 
we I think it can be portrayed better. Um, the the power supply actually sh shows up in a couple of places. So the the on the dollar table, the top part where it lists all the all the resources, the Chester Solar and Fitchburg and H11. Um, there were two pieces to that. The way the ISO New England markets work, you're required to sell any generation you have into the market and to buy all of your load from the market. And the reason they do that is because the generators get a credit based on their actual location. So if, if you are buying power from a facility in Massachusetts, then it gets a Massachusetts price for its value. Um, the NIPA contracts are a good example. They're in New York. So the price at the boundary between New York and New England is the price that they are paid is their value to the market. And, and that's for everything that isn't physically within our service territory. In your case, that's correct. It's anything, anything that's what they call behind the meter. So it's if it's not participating in the market, then it's treated differently. But all the resources that are in the market are treated the way I just described. Uh, and your load, they charge, ISO New England charges for your entire load requirement based on what they call the Vermont zonal price which is a weighted average of all of the locations inside Vermont. So because this is a location-based market, you're in the situation where even if you have a contract or you own a piece of a generator, the way the market recognizes it is you sell the generation to the market, you get a, a price for that, and you buy your entire load need from the market. So you end up with three pieces whenever you buy generation. You've got the, the cost to either uh, the operating cost for the generator, or if it's a purchase power agreement, the, the contract price that you're paying your supplier. So then you've got a credit for the amount of money ISO New England is paying you for the value of that generator or agreement. And then you've got the actual cost of the load that's associated with that. So the way that shows up in the footnotes that we sent you are the charges column represents the actual cost that you paid to us for, for the contract. So that's the price or the, the cost that is associated with the supplier. The credit piece is the amount of money that you got from the market or from ISO New England because you owned an entitlement in that particular resource. Now, it just so happens that this year, and it, it's not always the case, but for you this year, all of your contracts produced incremental value and reduced your net cost. Um, that's why they're all showing up as a negative in the total column. There are there are some years, and for other members, there are some resources this year um, where the contract price cost more than what the market value was, and that would have been that would have showed a positive number in the total. The the piece that's not obvious and that confuses things is if you go down to the the bottom section that says uh, VEPSA and other costs, there's a line that says energy markets. That is the three three million ninety nine thousand dollars That is what you actually paid ICE in New England for the service of your load after they took into account all of these generation transactions. So your total cost to serve your customers energy needs is the the uh, 2664 I'm looking at the original sheet you were sent 26 
$2,664,000 in cost minus the $3,741,000 plus the $3,099,000. That represents your position in the energy markets. So it would be the three million ninety nine minus seventy seven. Correct. Would be your net cost for energy in the ISO New England market. So I mean. So the three million eight at the bottom is the transmission costs plus the that's and other costs minus the one million seventy seven. That's correct. The three point eight at the bottom is the summation of the three numbers that are bracketed by lines. Yeah. The one million seventy seven credit, the one point two four five transmission and the 3.6, which includes the ISO cost for energy plus all of the other market transactions that go on. Okay, now the question is, where does H11 show up in this? Because this is captured that this is the cost of power from all power vendors sources. <clears throat> that is the error that I noted, that, I don't know if it was the commissioner, Mike. Okay, so that's, 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 that's the other sheets now. Right. So H11 will show up on the corrected sheet as a new line item under the resources with, with a cost only because it is not included in the market. So there's no credits coming back from ISO New England. So the, the corrected audit footnotes will actually show your cost slightly over $4 million because of the the sheet that you were given didn't include H11's production or right. the cost component. Shouldn't Wolkin also be in there? I mean, Wolkin has a cost. It's not, it's not, we're not paying it to a third party, but it's a cost that we incur. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's small, but it should be there. Yeah. So we, we have this ongoing debate on all the hydro plants because they are. They're behind the meter, so there, there's no market interaction. They just show up as reduction in load. And usually the utility that owns it records the cost in other line items. It's depreciation, it's you know, plant and service. It's So we have this back and forth about whether those costs should be included in power supply or not. And we usually default to not including them here because they're comp they're included in other components of your financials. Yeah, but if we're looking, trying to figure out what an overall cost of power is, if we don't include that, we're stating the overall cost of power. It seems to me though, this is notes to the financial statements and and it's talking, it's in the commitment section and we don't, it's not, well, it isn't the commitment. Right. But then the line above, instead of saying the cost of power from all power vendor sources should be from all third party power vendor sources. And then that, that Wolkit would clearly not be in there. I think that's the fix. Yep. That works. Unless people think differently. But I think when we talk power supply, Ken, I think it's real. I mean, well, you know, we're not going to have Wolkin for a while, so it's kind of moot. But um, it's for a while. But I, I, I think Wolkin ought to be in there. It's, it's not free. It's close to free, but <laughs> well, it's not going to be free anymore. <laughs> not for a while. Yeah. I mean, we can work with Mike to figure out how to reflect it. It's just, we want to make sure we're consistent so that we're not double counting things on the other side. Ha yeah. Happy to put it in there. We just want to make sure we treat it correctly. Yeah. Thank you. This this made a lot of sense and solved the mystery. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ken. You're welcome.
So, Steve. Hello. Here I am. <laughs> Find all the mute buttons and stuff. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to make you a co host too now. Oh, so I can share? Yeah. I'm assuming you're going to want to share your little sheet. Is this different from what was in the packet? No. Does everybody have the packet? Mm -hmm. the, then we, we don't need to. Yep. Mike? Yeah. Do you, do you have it? Yep. I do. Screen share. I have it. Yep. It's page 14. Yeah. We're, we're good. Do you want to share or not, Steve? No, need to. I was going to share. I have a a simplified summary that I was going to work from that I was going to share rather than the whole cost of service schedule. I guess we could do it either sure. way. Go for it. I, well, it won't let me. It says host disabled screen sharing. Oh, Mike, I just turned you on. Now, if I can find the right screen, here we go. There. Does it now show up? Yeah. Yeah. I'm cooking. But I can't read it. Okay. Is it big enough to read? Hang on. It's <laughs> just. Is that, is that better? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. I got to get your picture out of the middle of my screen here. All right. So I guess this is to be a discussion about <clears throat> really a preliminary assessment of a possible rate case. Um, basic assumptions. We assume the test year. 12 months ended July 2023 and if we file it mid-November um, the rate year would be calendar 2024 so what I've got on the screen here are the, the seven major areas of adjustment to the test year that we looked at we <laughs> talked about and I just got to say, they're all um, draft preliminary at this point. We talked through them, uh, and some of them we got documentation to put together. Some we don't have all the information, but the idea was we're we're trying to get something that's pretty close to give you a good idea of where this could wind up. Um, the first and biggest item is is tree trimming. Um, apparently, there's a new new contract. That would add two hundred thousand dollars a year to your tree trimming expenses. So we would just need to provide enough documentation for the department to consider that known and measurable. What 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 percentage increase is that in tree trimming? Hundred. Hundred percent. Yep. And what's going on is it's all the trimming for the CUDs. So for us to do the make ready work changing poles, moving wires, trimming, they have to pay for it. So this is a really a no cost item for us, but it does go into rate Well, well, let me ask a question then. If this is a no cost item, are, are you saying that you're gonna get reimbursed for all these make ready costs? We always do. Half, well, the, tree trimming, half the tree trimming that we do for the last 12 years goes back in. Oops, just lost that one. Yeah. yeah, I don't see how that's that's part. If we don't, if it hasn't cost us anything, how is it part of our right base? It shouldn't be. If if this works the way normal make ready works, really, basically, according to your pole attachment tariff, you you collect you collect the money for that make ready work. <laughs> up front anyways you 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 do the I think okay. they call it a ride out but you do the survey you yeah. estimate the cost to do the work yeah. the customer gives you a big whopping mm -hmm. deposit 
or is it maybe wait with pole attachments is it 50 percent maybe they give you a chunk of money and then when you're done with the work you true it up and you either charge them more or you give them back some you true it up to actual but um, those costs are all covered and paid for by, I guess in this case, the CUD or whoever you're doing the trimming and the make ready work for. The park is well, looking like. Yeah, I mean, it, this was a leftover from our last rate filing. We So Beth and I and Steve had a brainstorm meeting on this Monday or Friday, Friday. last week. Yeah. <laughs> this was a leftover that, and like you said, we're. we're brainstorming, throwing everything out there. And I threw that in there as a leftover from last time. So that makes perfect sense to me and that should not be, you know. So what are you, what are you saying? Are you agreeing, Mike, that maybe- I do agree, I do agree, yes. To take okay. it. <laughs> All right, I have a little bit of trouble understanding it. It's just a little bit of an echo, it makes it hard. I think it's because I'm 90 degrees from the microphone. Maybe. Take out number one. Take out number one, that's the consensus here. Okay, that, that's what the X represents. Um, so then Paris Supply, um, obviously we have not put together a, a rate case known and measurable Paris Supply number yet. And what I normally do in these early stages is I grab the latest budget that's available. In this case, I took 2024 from last year's, the, the five-year 23 to 27 budget and plop that in here. That results, that's $184,000 increase over the 12-month ended July actuals. And you'll note that it's a placeholder and I said it's probably optimistic. Typically, because you're into some restrictions because of the known and measurable rule, your your rate case power supply isn't quite as much as the budget. Velco is Velco's uh, BTA is always a really good example of this. Um, that number bounces around from year to year because if you're familiar with Velco, I'll assume for the moment that most of Velco's costs are recovered through PTF payments from the pool from ISO New England. And what goes through the VTA billing are basically the, the tag ends that the PTF payments don't pay for. The PTF payments can, can swing pretty wildly from year to year, which means the VTA swings. The upshot of that is the department looks at that and goes, who knows what that's going to be, but we're not going to put any faith in Velcro's budget. They haven't accepted Velcro's budget numbers since known and measurable for years and years now. So a lot of times we wind up in that case, you're, you're stuck with whatever Velco's actual was compared to what their budget may be as far as getting it into a rate case. So that's when there are a few things that are that way. If you, if you can't pin them down as known, then they wind up getting reduced or they come out anyways. So my whole point being $184,000 increase, I believe that's $4,044,000 on an annual basis for power supply. That's probably a little high, but it's what we have for an early estimate. And so, Steve, how do you, how do, how do we get in to a rate case? Uh, the argument that the wall cut is known and measurable. Right. Um, and, and it would seem, it would seem tough to go in without that. Right. Have, is there any precedent you can think of of how we how we include Wolcott since it was well, we a catastrophic a, loss? We had a similar situation in a recent in Barton's recent um, rate case. It wasn't quite as extreme, but just before we filed, the something broke in that unit. So we submitted testimony that 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 included. Um, a preliminary estimate of what the problem was and how long we felt that it would take to get it back online. And then, of course, you, you take the hydro generation out of the rate case calculation and replace it with something right. else. And it takes you back to the conversation we just had with Ken. Um, yeah. So you, you can do that, but you've got to submit some testimony. You've got to explain the details. You've got to talk a little bit about 
what's wrong with the with what's broken or what's wrong with the unit. Right, I assume this is flood damage. So with a little luck, DPS will be pretty receptive. So that that's how you you approach it. Um, for any of you that are back in the days of Vermont Yankee, it's it's almost kind of a replacement power calculation. Mm. Well, and that's what Ken was doing. It was a replacement power calculation. Yeah. So yeah. we're looking, you know, probably $180,000, dollars maybe, depending upon how long it takes, possibly more than that. Yeah, and of course, this 184 has nothing to do and doesn't have doesn't at all anticipate Wolcott being down. So you may not get all of the 180, but what we can add for Wolcott being down might might make that number much bigger. Well, in Ken's calculation, it's just yeah. and and Wolcott's going to be out for longer than that. Right. Eight in all likelihood, yeah. Got to make an argument for Wolcott. Okay, yeah, so bookmark the that line for our list. And just so, not to single anybody out, but Miles PTF he keeps referring to is pool transmission facilities. You know, that are, okay. You understand this? All right. Good job. Okay, no hey, sweat. The, the curse of acronyms that we all forget so used to, we forget. Sorry. <laughs> um, you, third item not, here. Not, not to interject here, but are there two pieces to walk it? Is it, there's the power supply piece that you guys are talking about, but if there is a actual cost to repair the plant, is there an ability? To, is there any way to structure that to get the debt service or the? Well, that's that will get our debt service up, yeah. and so they'll be happier with us. <laughs> it, it's very perverse. <laughs> very. There's probably actually three pieces to consider there because you've probably got um, some capital cost, which um, if you're going to, if you're going to have to borrow to repair the plant, we have um, to borrow to repair the plant. There's yeah, no so they don't have, you 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 can uh, we can try to pro form in depreciation and interest that will affect net income. Um, but I I, I would argue all, though. I, I would make the argument as the guy who brought this up. I I would suggest you in in this rate case, you model the absence of Walcott, not not the replacement of Walcott. And because it's not known, it's not measurable. We don't know the timing. We don't know the cost. If we try to estimate timing and cost, there'll be kind of wild ass guesses, which will make us look shaky. Whereas we just say that it's 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 down for the foreseeable future and while we're you know while we're working on a plan there is no plan well but by november this is this is talking about going into november steve well that was these numbers were predicated on that whether we'll make it in time for november is a good question but but by then we're going to know hopefully know a lot more about Wilkin. so i i, th I think roger your point right. is well taken but i think it depends on where we're at with, with the whole situation. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It and just it. remember with your modeling, like you can't start depreciating something until it's in service. So, you know, that's not going to be a great help for 2024. Um, the interest, if we've really spent the money, if it's gone out the door and we are truly paying interest, that would be. So we'll just have to see. I, I, I want to get as much as we can. I was just suggest trying to find a a uh, the clearest path to make the strongest argument. I think what you might want to do is both. First of all, you you got to do the replacement calculation because it's going to be out for however long it's right. out. So you you already have the challenge of having to put forth some sort of a, a rational, justifiable estimate of how long it's going to be out, right? If you can't do mm -hmm. that, you're not going to get replacement power or or maybe not all of it if it's going to be out a long time. And, mm -hmm. and, if, you, and if you can do that, if you can make a, a rational case for, we're pretty sure it's going to be 10 months and here's why, basically, or, mm -hmm. or 12 or 60 or two, whatever. 
<laughs> if you can make the case for how long it, it, it should be out based on what you know is wrong with it, then you can also make the case that you're going to have to spend capital costs and you may be able to make the case that you should pro form in some capital costs, some interest, some depreciation, um, depending on the timing and, and where, where that stacks up within the rate year. We've got to at least look at, at both pieces because you may be able to do some of both. I, right. I agree. The replacement cost is is probably the bigger piece, but there's no point in leaving the other piece on the table if you can come up with an estimate. I mean, I know nothing about what's going on with that unit. I mean, do you think the, we're talking a couple months or a year or two? or just uh, We're month? talking at least eight to ten months, I'm guessing. Okay, so we're in September. Do so we it might come back middle late in the right year. This is Vermont. It's going to be a year. Okay. <laughs> so the, the biggest uh, lead time item that the contractors were talking about was new switch gear, which they said was a minimum 15 month lead time and a hundred plus thousand dollars to replace it. So we're actually going to rebuild what's there and uh, that should help reduce the overall time that we're going to be down. Right. Have we so if you can, uh, let's say you're going to get the unit back in 10 months, but if you have to start spending money in January or now, we're already spending. It. Okay. But if, if you have to start borrowing money, you may, if you're if you're if your story on when it will come back and why it will take so long is 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 good is believable if if they accept it then they may very well accept performing in the financing to do the work over that period if you if you have contracts if you have if you can document it like it's a capital project you might be able to get some of both that's that's my only point but it'll, you know, it'll be some work probably to put together a good explanation. Uh, but if you get contractors looking at it and giving you estimates are, does that, where, where's the process go from here? I mean, do you, do you get to a point sometime in the near future where you have a contract for somebody to do the work that needs to be done? Is that how this plays right, out? So our, our first uh, and biggest step in front of us right now is nailing down a millwright contractor to tear the unit down and haul it down to Connecticut for cleaning and testing to tell us whether it needs to be rewound, whether, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that this is primo time that all millwrights are busy because it's annual shutdown time for every hydro I know about in the state and New England. Mm -hmm. And all look, they're all solidly busy and they don't want this yeah. work. Right. So we so we still don't even know the status of the turbine at this point. No. But and, and I know you a, can reach in and grab yeah. files of earth. Yes, there. no, we know we 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 know this problem. We don't have any Make a case for a minimum and a maximum expense. Right. I think we can build something up that's certainly just yep. uh, getting something. We don't want to omit. Yeah. It. So, so I think I think not to belabor the point. We know the power supply needs to increase because of the replacement power costs, and then we, and we have the carrying costs for the capital costs for Wolkitz. And we don't know what those are going to be yet, but we should know. Yeah. If within the next couple, couple months. of months. Yeah. I wonder if if one of the things we can also do, I mean, to to borrow another page from the old Vermont Yankee plant and their their replacement power outages, you know, their refueling outages. If you can get an, an accounting order to to defer and amortize all the repair costs to put the unit back in shape. And then recover them over you know a year or two once it's back online. Um, it doesn't help your well, actually, it would help your cash flow because what that does is it might set you up to borrow more easily at a better rate if you have recovery virtually guaranteed by an accounting order like that. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we'll have to talk we're about this. Principal rate though already. We're, we're Which is a pretty good idea. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that that's going to make a big difference because because we're we've we've got good estimate of the cut. a low rate anyway. Okay, so more discussion yeah. on that certainly to come. Yeah. yeah. So, next item: payroll expense. Um, we assumed a ten percent increase. Well, let's see, Mike. The the mid twenty twenty three ten percent increase is actually it's in the contract, right? Yeah, that was a done deal, and then we guessed five yeah. percent for next year. Yeah, and yeah, and if we can find a way, we've got to look at some of the surrounding utilities if they have contracts in place that have higher increases, and in then we may be able to use that to push that five percent up a little bit. Yeah, but and also we also discussed. Um, Steve brought up the point that if we're using, we are losing employees to contractors, which I know eight or nine guys have gone to contractors from GMP. We can use those contractor rates in our number as well. Okay. That we have to be able to compete to keep our employees from running away. Or if we lose employees, then we're going to have to pay the contract. Exactly. Yep. So go ahead. Hey, wait. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So that's that's worth looking into, and it may push that five percent up a little bit. So roughly fifteen percent gave you one hundred and fifty thousand, um, and then we assumed that medical would be seven and a half percent over twenty twenty three actuals. That's a twenty five thousand dollar piece. Um, we assumed a one million dollar issue. Was that related to Walcott, Mike? Yeah, is that one, the million is um, one of the proposals from one of the banks is for the million dollars at 5.1%, which I'm assuming is the one we're talking about here. And it is for both uh, flood relief, so it will include Wolka, but it will, we can also spend those dollars out of a line of credit of a million dollars for any capital expenditure uh, that we want to do, including the yellow barn, which was the other one we discussed specifically. Yeah. So depending on the timing and exactly how that plays out, this yeah. is a fifty thousand dollar. It's actually a hundred thousand dollar item in your rate case. It, it represents about fifty an additional fifty thousand in interest. If we can make the case that it's going to be there for the whole rate year. Oh, for sure. And but the other the other fifty out of that hundred is hiding in that net income line. And if you look at the note that's there, you're the six the negative sixty five thousand is an adjustment that gets you from one hundred twenty eight thousand of net income you booked in the test year down to a standard two times tier of sixty three thousand. And the reason that tier would be as high as the sixty-three thousand, that assumes that fifty thousand dollars of interest expense is going to be there to calculate the tier on. I mean, a tier a tier of two point oh is another way of saying your net income equals your interest expense. But the, the can you explain what the standard two times tier means? What why well, why what is it that you're talking about? We tier, have, we tier, have a tier stands for times. And the old ones. <laughs> Steve. Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if every. I thought somebody was still talking, and I thought maybe my audio failed. Um, tier is times interest earned ratio. It's, it's it's a form of coverage ratio that the department uses as a guide to setting that income. Or yeah, and it's based off your your in your long term interest expense. I mean, basically, uh, the act, how do I explain this? Whatever your interest expense is, the the department allows you. 
additional net income to make sure that you have enough coverage to always pay your interest. And, and the, 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 a tier of two, which, which is calculated as net income plus interest over interest, <laughs> um, which amounts to interest and net income being equal. That leaves you, that leaves you the, in this case, it would leave you the $50,000 of, of slack of um, cushion in your rates in case something else went wrong, you would still be able to pay your, your debt service. That's, that's the whole purpose of it. That's how it's calculated. Thank you. Understand the purpose. Well, yeah, if, we, we if you were, if we were not a municipal utility, if we were a investor on utility, then they would be looking at our cost of capital and looking at our interest payments and, and you'd, you'd have, it would be, it would be, this is a sort of the yeah. fudge factor that they use because we're not an IOU. Yeah, yeah I mean, the IOU gets done so, so differently as you know, it's a whole return on rate base, weighted average cost of capital debt and equity. This is kind of the, the fudgy muni version of it. You know, the department will say you don't you don't need you don't need um, much net income because you don't have to pay dividends. You don't have shareholders like an IOU does. But they say you do need you need enough you need enough cash to to pay your interest and have a little bit left over. And it's that's as well defined as I've ever seen it. The it's kind of a crazy approach, but it's the way it gets done here. Not kind of crazy. <laughs> it is crazy. <laughs> well, okay. okay, onward. Onward. So that's that's net income. It's a, it's a downward adjustment because your tier doesn't give you as much as what you had for net income in the test year. It, it is dependent on that interest. If, if for some reason we we don't get that debt issue into the rate case, um, then you won't get that extra net income either. They're, those are locked together. Um, what's left, the other miscellaneous item, um, there's, there's, a, there's several things buried in there. There was, we made a, in your last rate case, we made about a $30,000 upward adjustment in costs related to net metering. It's not really cost, it's more like lost revenue. But we discovered that that's a calculation that WEC has used successfully and we used it successfully. It basically has to do with, with estimating how much new net metering is coming onto your system in the rate year, how much revenue you won't collect because your your load will go down, but your rates will have been set on the higher load. And there's a there's a calculation that gets you to, to a number. So there's right now about 30,000 of that 55 that you see there would be related to updating the net meter the, the net meter lost revenue calculation that we did in the last case. It may be a little higher than 30,000 now because I'm sure you've had more net metering keeps coming right um and the rest of that item is payroll taxes the gross revenue tax the fuel tax i think it's basically those those are that's the whole list of stuff that makes up that 55. it all amounts to six hundred and three thousand. well it does for now you have the 200 or we well, we're taking right. off we're taking off one 200 but it's probably putting yeah, in another 200. Well, may, yeah, I mean, given the assumptions we've made here, if they don't change, it moves. 603, it gets you to an 8.72% rate increase. Okay. If we, if, we, if we take the 200 out, yeah, this isn't set up to calculate. Well, that one did. It's, it's okay. It's, it's, it's okay. okay. I, think we, I think we all follow. I understand. I have a question about the test here. Um, when you say 12 months end of July 2023, is that June 30th or is that July 31st? It's July 31st. July 31st. How, 
Okay, so we, we're picking up the flood and the after effects of the flood in there. And I'm just wondering which way that cuts. The flood costs right now are being capped a lot, so they're not even in these expenses. So even the extra, so all the flood costs or the walking costs are being capitalized. Oh. Oh. So even the restoration costs and all of that's being capitalized. Yeah. And for the potential of FEMA reimbursement. Uh, that's all another problem. But that's for the FEMA reimbursement. But we don't have that money. And what I'm thinking though also is that our, we, at least when I was looking at the July numbers in, in, in the, in the packet, it looked to me like sales were down. Um, and, and if we're using that, I haven't, I haven't figured out which that runs, but if we've got, if we've got a few, if we've got less, I suppose if we have less revenue than, than we need, but if we have fewer billing units, then, then, then right. it's the big creamer was given $180,000 in credit back for the second half of the great pairs to get their refund on the 13.03% we were billing. That's so that, the, these financials are a little skewed okay. because of that. But we included July because by the end of July, the net rate increase that we had approved is all balanced out as of the oh, end of July. Okay, because we've, we've, we've done all the refund right. products. So we've cleared that. Yes. Yeah, that's all done. Because otherwise, I guess that would have been. It kind of gets us to a clean point of what they Okay. Because uh, I was just wondering what the distortion was from from having distorted. Basically, oh, a couple of weeks of July that, that was weird. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so with the with the flood costs, some or all of them being in the in July, we probably need to look at that. To you know, we may need to normalize that. But on the other hand, not just the costs, it's the sales. Well, you're saying you had less sales because everybody's power was out. Well, some people's power was out for a period of a, a relatively short period, but some people, you know, the buildings are gone, and so there was no power being right. So, so that, but, but yeah, so you had abnormally low sales in, in, in July and around the flood period. Um, we could try to normalize that, but that doesn't help your rate increase. But no, I didn't think it did, but I think we need to be aware. Yeah. That, 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 that we may get questioned on that. That's all. Yeah. And, yep. Uh, yep. Roger had actually asked that question last uh, two months ago, last month, was he here last month? Anyway. Previous meeting, he had asked about running that, and I we did I did yeah. and went through all the BEPs and numbers, and it was in the noise. The difference it was there was no right. yeah right. Didn't, there was no difference there. Okay, the, 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 so long as so there, there's one other possibility there is I wonder if we could make a case for getting something extra in rates for the outage costs for the restoration i mean gmp does it regularly they of course have a alt reg arrangement but you know we're going to have a number of members with this issue and i don't know if there's a way if we can document and make the case that I don't, you know, a surcharge for a year or two or something to to cover yeah. those costs. We should definitely talk about that and include the, you know, the flood and the Christmas event were within the twelve month period. We could definitely come up with something for a monthly storm ad or just. I mean, GMP has three of them on my bill. Right. So, right. They have a little bit more mechanism in place to 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 make that easier for them. Although I, I hear the reportings are real pain, but anyways, we we might be able to 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 do something like that. Why not? And, and, yep. and if, if it can be done like as an incremental or surcharge thing for a, you know a specified time period, um, we might be able to generalize that to other other members, whether they're in the middle of a rate case or not. You know, I mean, maybe worth looking at if we can. Uh, yeah. 
if we can document and make okay. a case. That's okay. another one we'll get on our to-do list. Does anybody have any other questions for Steve? So if we drop that uh, number by the 200,000 and didn't make it up elsewhere, it would be a 5.83% rate increase we'd be looking at. So we we'll would make it up. We'll make it up. But Mike, but Mike, I think I think the uh, I think the Walcott's going to be somewhere around that number. Oh, I agree. So I think you'll you'll lose your tree cutting, but you'll you'll replace it with wall cut, and you'll kind of get to what you guys were thinking originally. Sure. Seems yeah, like it. How much the wall cut winds up being uh, replacement power? How much is capital? We'll look at all those. Yeah, the main model says five point eight zero without that two hundred, Mike. I just we have, my sheet didn't have. Yeah. Okay. okay. No other questions? So we'll be fine tuning this puppy for you for next time. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. You are welcome. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. The next item on the agenda is borrowing money. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a question. I mean, so Community National, we're talking about a line of credit. Yeah. Union yeah. Bank, we're talking about a long term loan. Yeah. Have we, we talked to Community National about a long term loan? Have we talked to Union Bank about a line of credit? Have we talked about some kind of a bond offering? Right. I haven't looked into a bond. I just went out to um, five local banks that Ken and Vepsa use across the state. Um, so which banks were those? It was TD, Union, Community Bank, Community National Bank. One more. Peoples. But anyway, the uh, two of the others didn't even respond. One of the others was like 7.2%, and these two were the two low ones. Community National. Community National, um, their municipal lender up in Derby, shared that they, community, actually created a bucket of money specifically for flood, flood issues for the municipalities in Vermont. And... I don't know if you notice in her language, she says, oh, it's a loan, uh, line of credit for flooding. And I called her back and said, well, wait a minute. Well, I'm not asking for money just for flooding. Yes, we're going to be working on our powerhouse. So it's going to take a bunch of capital money to fix that. But I also talked to you about other capital expenditures, specifically including the yellow barn. And we talked about that in depth. And she's like, yeah, yeah, that you, you can use it for all that. I'll be writing a letter for it, which she was supposed to get to me today to give to you, but she did not. So, But we're totally on the same page. As That's as, a hell of a good rate. Uh, I was in the, shocked. Yeah. In this market. Um, much better than, than, than the other one. Yeah. Um, and there, I mean, I, I think that the competition is 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 to look at some kind of a municipal bond off. I don't know what the what the long term forecasts are, but I mean, the expectations that I've seen, and and you know, others may be looking at different things, seeing different things, is that the expectations that interest rates are going to start coming down um, by the beginning of, of next year, um, which seems logical. Um always have to be careful about crystal ball gazing. Is that an advantage um, to a line of credit then? But that's that is exactly right. That's an advantage to a line of credit. Yeah. Um rather than locking into right. a long term loan at this point. Um especially when the line of credit is cheaper than the long term loan. Yeah. Um so um, um I, I, we're you're assuming, Lynn, you're assuming that there's a 
no option to prepay without penalty and refinance. If, if it were a 10 year locked rate with no prepayment penalty, I would vote for the 10 year because it just gives us that optionality, gives us something that we're covered on and we're not scurrying around in a year looking for new financing. Well, the, the, the term, uh, the term loan, uh, the line of credit also had an option to renew. Yeah, but the, it's an annual. It wasn't, maybe I misread it. I've got it open on my screen okay. here. Yeah, but the other it, though, um, I think it was also for the same amount and we're gonna need it. It's a case of turning it back over. It's a question of how long we're paying it back over rather than, to me, that's the difference. One is being advertised over 10 years and the other is, is being paid back. Um, it doesn't really say what the what the payback period is. Yeah, but I assume that with the line of credit, my assumption was that, 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 that there's no commitment to go beyond the one year period. You know, it's their option to extend us or not. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, I, so I, that's I, why I... That's why I'd favor the longer term, as long as there's not a prepayment penalty. Well, if we were borrowing the whole amount, because I can't do decimal places in my head. Um, is, is what, is $5,000? I, I, I screwed it up doing it. Fifty thousand dollars is is half a percent, and I'm looking at the difference in interest rate between the two, oh, okay. which is roughly half a percent. And that's that's five thousand dollars. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, so it's not it's not a significant difference. So these, I believe, these are both good for forty five days. So if you have follow-up questions, you want me to get answered, we have you know a couple of weeks where we could do that. Well, it'd be interesting to see what what the community would do on a long term. I'll ask. And what um national community. Community national, national. Yeah, would, would do on a long term. Community is not good on this. And what and what uh union would do on a lot of credit and see I'll ask. Okay. can't hurt. I don't know what municipal bond rates are. And if you have other, any of you have other questions, you want me to- I mean, the other thing, the other thing that we people have is there's a little technical glitch here. In this amount, we've got to get a town vote on this, yeah. which yeah. which if it has to be within 45 days, we've got to get moving on. Yeah. Because I don't know what the warning period is for that. I'm not sure either. But it's uh -huh. a section 108 process. It's that's what it's called. So yeah. look it up. Uh, probably good to talk to LP about it. Um, okay. Or it's for yeah, but uh, whoever the town. Um, difference with 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 a long term loan is if, if we're drawing the whole thing at once, then we're paying interest right away. I don't know. I don't. There's so little information about the loan in here that it's hard to know what they're proposing. Well, communicate. Uh, so I, I, I think we need, I think right. need to know, and if we need to have a meeting, you know, sooner, we should be prepared yep. to do that. Um, Next Monday would be out. Okay, well, I'll ask them to give each other's opposite tomorrow, which is no problem. But again, if you have other follow up questions, please email them to me and I'll be ready to them. And we could actually, and Mike, each of them since, the, since time is of the essence on this, I might suggest actually getting the loan documents um, so we can see the fine print, you know, and do a full. We don't want them coming to the meeting. Okay. No, I think I think having the documents and seeing what the terms, yeah. what all the terms are, okay. um, yeah. those and send those to everybody. Um, then we can look at that and um, what.
what's what's people's availability next week um, apart from uh, apart from monday which is young before that that would not work for me but i can be available any other evening tuesday wednesday thursday Mike and Roger, what's your availability Tuesday, Wednesday? Uh, I'm open next week. Yeah. Next week is good for me. I'm sort of scanning. I don't see okay. any evening problems. Tuesday, Wednesday. Tuesday or Wednesday? Tuesday's better for me. Okay. Tuesday it is. Okay. Hey, just going back to the loan, are we convinced a million dollars is enough right now? And if we need more, do we get to go back later, or should we be looking at a bigger number now? I'm pretty confident a million dollars is going to sit us sit us well. Okay, including the yellow Again, bond. Again, mean, barring some boomerang that hits us when this thing gets down to Connecticut, uh, in which case we can go back for more. We could go we back plenty of time. time. Yeah. What I guess the other question is how quickly. Well. Yeah, that was never mind. I was going to say, how quickly do we think we're going to need start needing? Well, we still have our 200,000 yeah. line of credit sitting here unused. So if we get into a crunch tomorrow, we have money to go. Again, again the, the change in interest rates isn't going to be material. No, I don't think so. And if we wanted to look into bonding, how would we explore that? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. We need bond council. I don't. I don't, I think that's a process that probably is going to be harder for us to to do. But the town has done bonds. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. We can find, I'll find out. You can find out what what's. So well, we have plan on a meeting Tuesday. Tuesday. Give these rates. Remote. I'm not sure that. Yeah. Zoom. It's going to be much lower. Yep. And I imagine the transaction costs are higher. Four p.m. when. 4 p.m. Tuesday. 4 p.m. Tuesday would be good. That's a question to that. That would be too early for me. That's sure. Right. Okay, well, because one of the that, that's a later item on the agenda. Um, but we can do so it at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so good news. We should go and get some money really yeah. easily and relatively inexpensive. So yeah. that would which, the 26th. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments on borrowing? Yeah. Okay, which takes us to the general manager's report. And Mike, I would love for you to walk us through the, the map in the first paragraph because I could not get these numbers to to go out. Okay. What did I do wrong? Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, if I understood, you said that that twenty percent of the costs would be for the yellow bar, yeah. and that was twenty percent of the eight hundred thousand. Yes. Okay, so twenty. So that means eighty percent would be for us. Yes. Which is six hundred and forty thousand. Yes. Okay, and then you say we're looking at roughly four hundred and eighty nine thousand, and. But then you also had some 151,000 that was being charged to the project. I, I just, I, I. Okay, so let me go through it. So the DPS uh, said, this is the way you should do it. You wrote me a very confusing email. Then <laughs> what, what you passed on no, to us. <laughs> uh, others, including Eli, go through and tell me what it said. And what they said was, you have to determine a percentage of those costs that are going directly to the project, directly to serve the project. So of the $800,000, 20% of the capacity of the rebuilt line and 20% of the capacity of the upgrade substation equipment will go directly to them. So if it's $800,000, they pay that 20%. Boom, that's there. So, so that's is that like a but for cost that but for yellow bar project we wouldn't be incurring exactly. this cost. Okay. Yes. And then they allow us to bill them directly for the cost of borrowing the money that we need to borrow to do the project. 
in the years that we had to accelerate the project because uh, we know we're going to have to do this job on the line. We know we're going to have to do this job on the substation, but it's a minimum of three, probably five years out with our flat load growth. So I think I threw three years in there for discussion and that came out to the 151. Okay, so that's so that's so that's three years on the eight hundred thousand on the on the debt service. The debt service, yeah. Which goes to them as and, well. And 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 so you came up with that. Okay, so we're saying eight hundred thousand and I, I don't know what, what were you were amortizing it over? Uh ten years. Ten years. Yeah. So just Doing this very simply, yeah. so that's eighty thousand a year plus the interest cost on 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 the unpaid balance. But if we're just doing this simply, another five percent would be another four thousand. So eighty four thousand. So how did you get one hundred and fifty one thousand? I'm not sure. I don't have the spreadsheet. Okay, right, but it looks like I screwed up. All right, so then the 151,000, so how did you get the- Oh, you know what it is? No, I amortized that over only the five years that we would delay, and I used the first three years of it. Huh? Why did you use, why Why would you use, if-, if... I, get, I gotta get the spreadsheet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next Tuesday. I can go through these numbers better Tuesday if you want. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Because the other question was where the 489 came from. Okay. I'll redo this paragraph. What, what could be helpful is to see what the annual, total annual cost is of, of the project. So, it's, I mean, cost is 800. But then how that, that's being financed. Yeah, yeah. okay. On, on, on an annual basis, because I think you would do that and then take the first three years if that's what you're saying the delay is right. or the yeah, advancement is. And, and, and so they pick up the whole cost for those years or just the, the care? They pick up all, all of it. Okay. Just for my own edification, three years sounds like awfully short period of time we're talking about infrastructure development is that i guess what what's what's the the general attitude when it comes to um picking up the costs of these projects what's like a, what's a time horizon where we, we say this is the utility's responsibility versus someone else's if what we're doing is something benefiting all customers mm -hmm. it's ours mm -hmm. so the, the trigger on this project is the need of the project. So mm -hmm. normally, cost causers pay yep. the cost they create. So they would pay everything. But in this instance, where we're upgrading a substation that obviously serves everybody, and a circuit that can serve everybody in our, our contingency configurations, it's, that's why I asked the department for some guidance. No, hey, how do you want us to do this? Absolutely. I'm, I'm hearing that it, it would have been an upgrade uh, on the three-year year time horizon for for plant. Anyway. Anyway. So the question, I guess, is when do we say, oh, you know, three years is really a, really a rounding error for our planning purposes, or one year is error, or it's two um, months. No, no, it's not. It's, yeah, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a rounding. I think what Mike is saying is, and I don't know if we do we have this in our IRP. I these upgrades in our IRP. The circuit upgrade and the substation upgrade are both in our last five IRP. That's why I was like, well, hey, wait a minute. Yep. And, just and, paying and, for this or not? Yep. Yeah, yeah. And so, and that was in for what year? We got to do them every three years, and ours is due to be reopened this coming year. So it's at least three years in. Yeah. No, no, but what year were we projecting that we were going to be doing it? Oh, we were going to project and we were going to be doing it already. We have actually done, done some of it already yeah. under our, you know, X amount of capital dollars a year projects. Yeah. We actually built, uh, we built the section to be able to serve uh, clean cannabis, yeah. one of our big customers. We we built the, train, the new transmission line sections and put the underbuilt in there. Didn't build them for that because mm -hmm. that's part of our IRP plan. Yep. Yeah. 
but but it, it's it's looking at I think what you're saying is looking at our current load and load growth. Yep. The estimate is we would need to be doing this for system stability three in three in three to five years, yep. and we're being conservative in terms of or actually you know benefiting the customer. Yep. Yep. Um, by say at the low end mm -hmm. of that that range. Okay. But but that's yeah. So yeah, your question is is valid, and that's why I went to the DPS. Is yeah, this one's an anomaly. How do you want us to? I, th I think the question still stands for for understanding purposes how we consider different periods of time for plan upgrades, and it sounds like a three year period is where we're, we're talking it about. It depends on where it is on the system and what the upgrade is. There's, right. no, there's no set. Okay, it's just it's just looking at that. Let you do it all at once. Where the needs are, where customers are coming in, mm -hmm. where load is growing, uh, what the condition of the system is. I think we're we're we're, we're and here. and also all these types of projects go through an actual uh, system load flow analysis. Mm -hmm. So the engineers could have come back and said, "Oh, not a problem. You guys can accommodate sure. this," and there would have been no concern. Yep. Uh, but that wasn't the case. I mean, I think I think we we no longer have the 1930s system. No, it's got a good system. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's not that long ago that it stuff was. Up, yeah. That up in the northern part of the service territory. I mean, it was stuff that just desperately needed to upgrade. Yeah. So, okay. Um, any other questions or comments about the general manager's report? Hearing none, that takes us to the financial statements. Any questions or comments about that? I have a question for, um, for Beth, and it's really not on the actual pages submitted, but given that this is looking back all the way to July, Beth, roughly where are you right now on your cash balance? Are we, uh, are we in the same, same range? What do you mean by same? Right? Oh, you mean now as compared to this? Um, yeah. yeah, our our cash is it's, it's probably about in that same range. I report that to Mike every week. Um, right. right now, we're doing okay. We're I right. the near future. I don't foresee us needing the line of credit. Great, thank you. Yeah, so our next set of financials will be a good indicator of where we're really sitting because all the refunds will be behind us and. The dust will have settled on the last rate case. So, uh, I did. I did want to report back to y'all some questions y'all had from the audit. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions was, uh, "What it was reported as purchase of property and equipment went up significantly?" It's not just purchasing property and equipment. It includes work orders, capital additions, our normal construction that we do. Um, so the breakdown actually came to be about 300,000 was actually just for work orders, capital additions that we had been putting in. Um, and that kind of coincides with what we've done the year before. Um, I had to do about $100,000 on uh, just uh, accounting entries back to 2016 when there was a conversion. We had about 100,000 that was just hanging out there <laughs> that I identified and I put them to plant where they should have been going this whole time. Um, and then we did purchase a couple of vehicles last year, as well as, and I can't get this vendor's name pronounced correctly, Low and Cody, is it Cody? Yeah, yeah they did about $100,000 out there on the hydro. So yeah, it was a little bit high. It was higher than it the previous year, but I just want to give y'all a breakdown. Um, and the prior year was actually a low year, which made yeah. it spread with even bigger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Another thing was, uh, I believe, Lynn, you had mentioned there was a jump in the customer accounts. It went from like 130 to 230 in one year. 130 was actually very low because that was the year that the staff was very, our number of employees in the front staff was very low. It was reduced way, way down. So that's the that allocation of labor mostly? Yes, okay. yes. And then that following year is when I came in. I had one question on page 28. 
on operating revenue for July. So I mean, which dropped it was way, way below budget. Was that because he, that would just in the blood? Or, no, or? no, no. It was the, the refund that we had to That's get. That's the refund. And yeah. it wasn't necessarily that um, we didn't get the cash in. We just, we billed the same we normally bill, but we had to give them all that credit back. Okay, so that's, that's what, what that's it was. Right okay, yep. yeah, yeah. Without that, we would have been very much closer to our, our budget to the yeah. count. That will just that is a big variance. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So on this, who? Farman, you still there? It's muted. He's muted. He's muted. He's muted. He's muted also. Going into uh, these are small items in the accounts payable distribute, you know, the, the ledger report. Mm -hmm. Um one just jumped, jumped out at me because it was a payment um to Brian. And and the, the description is personal truck use. Was this paying him for using his truck? Paid him mileage for using his truck okay. since it was broken down. Okay. Which he didn't put in for. I told him to three times. I finally put it for him. Okay. It went, you know, it just it just seemed an odd caption. Yep. So maybe if it comes up again, just say, you know, well, mileage, mileage for business yeah. use of personal vehicle yep. or something. Okay. Um and then there were a couple of, of Entries that for, for you, Beth, that were parking in Adobe for office? Uh, normally, we pay for Adobe uh, with a uh, company credit card. That company credit card expired, and they had that tenure right then, so I paid it. But and what, then got reimbursed for it. But what was the parking? Uh, it's part of my uh, travel stipend. So you grouped two things together. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I just I, I was trying to relate it to it. But they're two totally separate things. <laughs> it's very weird. What do you mean? There's a little house in Burlington that I parked my car. <laughs> and the, the other one was was the outage dispatching. So this is the company that monitors the phones, and which was a substantial number. And I so it was it was thirty three hundred. Is that for one month? The flood. Outages for that so direction. so do we pay based on the number of calls? Yeah. Hmm. Well, so we're going to get a storm. We get hammered. Yeah. So how much it would be? It would be interesting to know how much we pay on an annual basis. <laughs> um, it's good. Yeah, I would be interested to know what we pay on an annual oh. basis. Because depending on what we pay, maybe we're hiring somebody. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I I I, uh, I saw we it on the face, but I, I just twenty four hours. We'll away. get you the number. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's not the way we're paying. We're paying by call. No, the IRS right. that it's twenty four seven coverage. Yeah, and just right. that's. Well, look. I just I, I think it's it'd be good to know what we're yeah. what it's costing. And that was those are all my questions. I don't know if anybody had anything else. How often do we pay them so for GIS services? Monthly. For the. Just a rough idea of the scope of like a, a two thousand dollar project. Though, what were they doing? So the GIS project was still technically being built. Mm -hmm. um, the GIS technician actually just left and went to a new job, so they're looking to fill the position. Yeah, um, but he's kind of building the whole database for all the VEPs and members working on standardizing, okay, this is the data we're gonna track on every poll to everybody. Yep. We're not gonna do transformers and cutouts for you and every nut bolt and washer for you. You know, he's yep. building all those. He's taking data from each of us and putting that into the GIS model. So our model at the moment consisted consists of a LIDAR project we did. So we have all our polls located. Yep. Which is great, all GIS and whatever, but none of the gaps have been filled in. There's no pictures to, you know, yep. some of the other unis are, are all done. Yep. Uh, and we're kind of, we got a price tag from 
one of the vendors, Empower, who kind of offers the service to go build everything for you. Yeah. It was like three hundred thousand yep. dollars. Yep. I got the white art project done. Hey, we have a map of here's our whole system. We can start filling in blanks for ten thousand. Yep. So oh, that's, that's kind of where we're going to go from. And it's once that database gets built and we know, hey, these are the things we want to track. We'll start, you know, a snowy day. Hey guys, go take some pictures of this line. Yep. And we'll start building that data. Is any any of that already being gathered from the bank work? No. Not ours. Now, some of it is getting gathered by the CUDs. Mm -hmm. And I actually partnered with NEK when I did the LIDAR because they wanted that whole data. Right. So they got a copy of the data. I'm sure they'll give us a copy of their data once they're done with all their stuff. So, nice. yeah. Thank you. Anything else on the financial statements? So, in um, Ken and Steve, um, we need you to leave because we're going to go into an executive session. Can we can we can we remove them from the session? Have a good night. I'm leaving. You might have to. Can't see what I'm doing. Is that where I want to go? Right there. Yep. Yeah. Is there an option? Yeah. Uh, the bottom. No, no, that's green. Really no, we'll call post commissions. I don't know. You can do a chat and tell them. Yeah, maybe, maybe try removing that and see if it changes the action. No. Oh, mine says remove is an option. Yeah, remove. Okay. There we go. Second from the bottom. Okay, yeah. here we go. There it is. Thank you, sir. He's not, he's not yeah, no, I think he just left it on. So I would like to move that we go into executive session to discuss a litigation matter with the council, the premature disclosure of which prejudice the interests of the public electric department. Second. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes. It is 7.14 p.m. and we are out of executive session. No action was taken. I move that we authorize our council to file the petition for declaratory judgment to quiet title to real estate um, with the Superior Court of Vermont. Of Vermont. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, Brooke. Let, let Thank us know if that's filed, Brooke, for elect my company. Will do. You all have a good evening. Thanks, Brooke. Thanks. Um, I don't want to keep going. Okay, cold. Under, this is going to be two very short things. One is to keep having permanent hybrid monthly meetings. So, and I, I just, I think that people have just gotten so used to well, dialing in. Well, it works I, out tonight, so. Okay. As opposed to not As to just having it oh. in person. And, um, but that the commissioners <laughs> should be encouraged, strongly encouraged to be in person, if at all possible. Um, so that was one item. The other is, I personally, I have a feeling it may be an issue for you, uh, would like to start the meetings earlier. I am tired of getting, I mean, this is relatively early and it's just not healthy to be eating dinner at 8.30 at night. Um, and it's too early to eat dinner before the meeting starts at five. I would like to start at four o'clock um, for, for, for our regular meetings. I mean, if, you know, if we're having like an extra meeting or something, would you be able to do once a month? And I don't mean put you on the spot. Yeah. Maybe it's an issue for other people too, but. Does it help if you can Zoom too? 
Yeah, I think the, the hybrid option is great. Um, why is, I have a standing meeting that I think I will reschedule. Okay. That, yeah, no, and I mean, you know, if, if we're having a special meeting like next week, I don't have any yep. problem about once in a while, but just this regular mm -hmm. thing, I, I, it's, it's it's been wearing for... <laughs> So, so yeah, so we'll switch the regular meetings then. Sure. If everyone, Mike, Roger, Nat. All good. Yep. For me. Yeah, next Tuesday, though, is. It'll be, be, be at five. It'll be at five. Be at five and be remote. Yep. Yeah, it can be remote. Okay, well, we have to have somebody. I, I'm here. Yeah. I may, I may come, but. Yeah, because I have a meeting. It's yeah. For all of our meetings are going to have a remote option. Okay. Um, and that's good for starting earlier too, in terms of public accessibility during business hours. Yeah, yeah. And they're recorded. They're, they're recorded. Yep. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, right. okay. that's leaving. <laughs> <laughs> is there, <laughs> oh, now is there a leaving. motion to adjourn? Go no move. <laughs> Second. Is it? All those in favor? Aye. Anyway, Mike. Roger, bless you. Thank you for. Thanks, guys. If you're still awake. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still awake. Let the record show. <laughs> it's... Where, where are you, Roger? I'm in Italy. It's 1.19 a.m. Oh, funny. Look at All right. I'm going to have sweet dreams now. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.